This is the most exciting time in the world of Alzheimer's disease. And the reason being, we have two new drugs that are approved for Alzheimer's disease, including lecanemab and donanemab. Now, these two drug approvals came after a long wait of more than two decades for any drug to get approved for Alzheimer's disease. So you can imagine the anticipation as well as excitement from the medical providers, the patients, as well as their caregivers. By the way, if you're new here, I'm Dr. Verma. I'm a board certified neurologist with fellowship training in adult behavioral neurology, as well as special qualification in child neurology. And this is a channel that is dedicated to individuals suffering from cognitive decline and their caregivers. Now in this particular video, we are going to talk about a very exciting topic and I promise I promise you this is one of the most frequently asked questions in my dementia clinics. That is, doctor, can I get the latest drugs for Alzheimer's? Now we will break down this question into three simpler questions and eventually we will arrive if you can get the medications or not. So let's jump right in. First, we're going to talk about who can get these medications. Then we'll talk about the specific conditions that preclude an individual from getting these medications. Last but not the least, how will your doctor determine whether you qualify for getting these medications? So make sure to stick around till the end of the video to hear more specific information in regards to you to learn if you can get these medications or not. So let's start with the first question. Who can get these medications? Now, both of these are anti-amyloid medications. So it is important to see if an individual has amyloid in their brains before giving them these medications. How do you find that out? Well, there are two studies that are available and these include a picture of the brain or a spinal tap. In terms of the picture of the brain, the specific study is called as the PET amyloid scan. And in this study, you get an IV infusion of a radio tracer. And this tracer goes on and looks for amyloid in the brain. And if it finds it in the brain, it goes and attaches to the amyloid. And once that happens, and if you take a picture, the picture really lights up with a lot of amyloid if someone has it in their brain. The second study is called as the CSF or the spinal tap study. And in this study, what we do is we draw a little bit of the spinal fluid that goes around your brain as well as your spinal cord. And then based on the numbers in this fluid, we determine whether you have amyloid deposition in your brain or not. So that really makes sense, you know, first checking if you really have amyloid or not. But the recommendation is to first see if an individual has cognitive impairment or not. And if an individual has cognitive impairment, then to figure out why are they experiencing the cognitive impairment. And for both of these drugs, the degree of cognitive impairment that was studied was the early stages of Alzheimer's. That is to say, mild cognitive impairment or mild dementia. And how do we know what is the degree of cognitive impairment that an individual is experiencing? Well, for that, we have different ways of testing. First, getting a good history, learning about them, learning about their functional status, how many of the activities of daily living are they able to do or not, and in addition, also doing a screening cognitive test as well as detailed cognitive testing. Now, in both of these studies, the researchers used a specific screening cognitive test, which is also called as mini mental status examination. And this scale goes from zero to 30. And 30 is the best score that you can get and zero is the minimum score that you can get. And because we are talking about early stages of Alzheimer's disease for lecanemab, Map, individuals who were in the trials had the score between 22 to 30 and for denanemab the individuals who had score between 20 to 28 were the ones who were included in the study however we do not have data for individuals who had more cognitive impairment beyond mild dementia or individuals who had 
no cognitive impairment. So actually the first thing that you need to make sure is that you're experiencing some early or minimal cognitive changes that a doctor can objectively verify. And the second step is to find if you have amyloid in your brain. So now that we have reviewed who can get these medications, let's also review who cannot get these medications and what are those specific conditions that can cause exclusion from getting these medications. So number one is any other condition that is causing your cognitive impairment. So as we talked about earlier, we want to attack the amyloid protein and we want to make sure that that is the reason that is causing the cognitive impairment. But if you have any other medical, neurological or psychiatric condition that is affecting your cognition, they can also confound the picture and in that case it is recommended not to give these medications. Similarly, an individual can have mixed dementia. That is to say they can have different kinds of proteins in their brains or different kinds of pathologies in their brains that cause for them to have cognitive impairment or dementia and as you can imagine because these drugs only work on the amyloid protein if someone has other kinds of dementia or other kinds of bad proteins in their brains that are driving the cognitive decline even if they are in addition to amyloid we do not know how much of the contribution comes from which disease and that was the primary reason that we did not have these individuals who had a mixed dementia diagnosis included in the studies for lacanumab and donanumab and again because they were not included currently we do not have the efficacy as well as safety data for these individuals so currently if you have a diagnosis of any other kind of dementia including vascular dementia or Lewy body dementia or frontotemporal dementia it does not matter if you have amyloid in your brain or not because you are excluded another thing that could cause an exclusion from getting these infusions of lecanemab and donanemab is having a stroke or a transient ischemic attack or having seizures or status epilepticus within 12 months of the time that you're questioning if you can get these therapies. Since these are immunologic medications, another contraindication to getting these medications is having an immunologic diagnosis or having an active immunotherapy that you're getting for any other immunologic condition. Both of these medications, lecanemab and donanemab, were associated with a very specific side effect call ARIA. ARIA stands for Amyloid Related Imaging Abnormalities and this basically stands for edema or hemorrhage that you can have as a result of these anti-amyloid therapies. So the researchers wanted to make sure that an individual does not have any condition where their tendency of bleeding is already increased at baseline. And that was the reason that a lot of individuals who had this tendency were excluded from the study and at this point we do not have further data in regards to their safety and efficacy. So what kind of conditions resulted in exclusion? If you are someone who has a bleeding tendency, if you are someone who has platelets less than 50,000 or if you have your international normalized ratio less than 1.5, then you do not qualify for getting these medications. But when we talk about just having an increased tendency of bleeding, we should also think about medications that some individuals might be taking. For instance, having antiplatelet therapies like aspirin, clopidogrel, having anticoagulant medications like warfarin. These medications, we do know, increase the risk of bleeding. Therefore, what is the recommendation for these individuals? Well, for both the trials, there were some individuals who were included who were on low-dose aspirin and their risk of developing the ARIA side effect was not higher than baseline, so it is okay for someone to be on a low dose of aspirin. 
but within the class of antiplatelets there are some stronger antiplatelets and for these medications we still do not have the safety and efficacy data. So another class of medication that can increase your risk of bleeding is called as anticoagulant medications. These medications are on the screen here and since these medications are associated with an increased risk of developing a brain bleed if you are on any of these medications, you currently do not qualify for getting the anti-amyloid medications. So talking in the same direction of having an increased risk of bleeding and increased risk of developing aria, one of the recommendations was also to obtain a brain MRI and make sure there are no small micro hemorrhages, no more than four micro hemorrhages, no big hemorrhages in the brain, no old big strokes and other conditions that can lead to an increase increased propensity to develop aria. So let's talk about what tests your provider will do to determine whether you can get these medications or not. So number one, they will do a detailed clinical history as well as examination. They will make sure you do not have any conditions that exclude you from getting these drugs. They will also conduct a review of your medications to make sure you're not on any medications that increase your risk of developing infusion side effects or the aria side effect. In addition, also determining that there are no other medical or psychiatric conditions, especially depression, that might cause cognitive impairment and that might confound the clinical picture. The second step would involve doing an objective cognitive testing, and this could include the mini mental status examination that was included in the trials or having a more detailed cognitive testing if your provider thinks that is necessary and in addition also your provider will either do a questionnaire for functional assessment or will talk through the different activities of daily living to ascertain what degree of cognitive impairment you have. In addition, you will need an MRI of the brain as we just discussed in the exclusion criteria. We need to make sure you do not have other kinds of dementia that are causing your symptoms as well as you don't have any conditions that can increase your risk of developing infusion reactions or aria. And with that, we should also talk about having a study done to make sure you have amyloid in your brain. So this could be the PET amyloid scan or the CSF or spinal fluid biomarkers to make sure you have amyloid in your brain. Now, in addition to all of these studies, there's one special test that I have not talked about in this video, and that is the Apple E test. In this test, we look at the genetic makeup for ApoE gene and if you want to learn more about this gene as well as the risk factors associated with developing aria please check out my video here but to summarize this gene is strongly recommended to be tested before an individual can get the anti-amyloid therapies. The reason being certain numbers on this genetic testing can determine a higher risk of you developing the ARIA side effects. So it's really important to know your exact genotype or the genetic makeup of ApoE gene so that you know how much risk of ARIA you as an individual have for developing the side effect. So hopefully this video was helpful. I have also reviewed these two drugs, lecanemab and donanemab, and have had a head-to-head -head comparison between these two drugs in my video here. In my future videos, I'll talk more about the clinical trials that were done for both of these drugs. Till then, take care and goodbye.